Greetings all. Okay, before we get started, a quick merchandising plug. I mean, it's the Tank Museum are fairly blatant about it, why can't I be? The lads over at Everpress are currently selling the next batch of t-shirts. In addition to the previous Tank is on Fire, Significant Emotional Event, Drive Me Closer and Remove It designs, which have been relisted, we've also launched a new design for my Emotional Support Missile, which seems to have started a bit of a fan following of its own. Now, unfortunately, the sample shirt hasn't gotten to me yet, and I need to record. In the faint hope that deliveries will occur by Christmas, though, the shirts have been on sale and advertised on my Facebook and Twitter feeds for a while, but it's only a couple of days after the release of this video that orders will remain order open before they have to go into production. And, of course, can openers is still available. But now to business, and back to some exciting readings from the archives. I have in the past done a few videos as to the what and how of US vehicle development and of course I've covered some of the feedback reporting in the initial campaign in North Africa. I have not however really spent much time on the decision making over what will be sent to the troops and how. Again, and some of this probably is already known to you but perhaps needed to be placed in a different context. After all, for example, it's very easy for us in hindsight to say something like well, this equipment existed and should have been used, but when a decision was made at the time, was it just ignorance or was it a rational choice? After all, we know what was being developed in the US, we have a general idea of what was being said at the pointy end, but what are the folks who are making the decisions as to what to send from the US to the troops? I've already mentioned how, in 1943, a decision had to be made as to which vehicle will be the backbone of the US forces for the invasion of Europe, tank-wise, and how the M4 was selected over the various developmental vehicles that Ordnance was proposing, notably the T-23. By way of example, a conference was held in December of 1943, in the words of Colonel Osborne of Requirements Division Army Service Forces, who chaired the meeting, quote, to analyze the list of modifications for the medium tank N4 series and determine which modifications should be presented to theater commanders for their consideration." Unquote. Now they categorized these as either essential or desirable. What these were were field modifications for issue to units in the field, basically kits. Uh, not improvements which were going to happen on the production lines for future production uh, because it was already being done. The list of modifications was initially compiled by Armored Board but the point of asking the theater commanders was to see whether or not they desired the modifications and if so, in what quantity. This was done, in the words of Colonel Dean, Requirements Division Army Grand Forces, quote, in the interests of limiting shipping space and avoiding the waste that would result if these kits were shipped over on the basis of a guess made in this country. Now, it's easy to think that the country were just pumping out Liberty ships in ridiculously short timelines might be a little bit short on shipping space, but there was a very definite bottleneck between the production plants and the quayside in the UK. The first solution was incredibly obvious, but it also makes a very obvious statement as to the limitations of shipping. Tanks were being produced in the US faster than they could be shipped overseas. As a result, the depots started to have a backlog of tanks, and there wasn't any particular thought being given, when shipping space was available to take tanks out, as to which tanks should be sent overseas from this depot of backed up tanks, and oftentimes the most recent production vehicles were not the ones being shipped out. They might go first in, first out, for example. If the more recent production tanks were sent first, it could well be that the older vehicles would not be sent for a very long time and thus conversion kits for them, or update kits, uh, at least them, would not need to be shipped either. As much as possible, these older tanks would be retrofitted by the US-based artificers before they would be shipped out, meaning it would not be unusual for units on the receiving end to receive older tanks after more modern ones. Probably, you know, probably to their confusion. The next obvious comment, but also worth mentioning, was that the field units were set up to maintain the tanks which were in use, not to, in effect, extend manufacturing capabilities overseas, and there would be only so much capability in an ordnance unit to install it. I mean, think about it, they were 
you, when you create your ordnance unit, you're creating it to support the table of organization of the unit. As a result, priority was to be given to fire control equipment to help destroy enemy tanks. Still, the limitations were such that it was concluded that it may well have been more practicable to simply ship new production tanks instead of relying on field modification kits. And that should tell you how seriously they considered the issues of trying to not overload the guys in the theatre. Now, I might have thought that sending a few more guys to do the work might have taken less room, but that, that's the way that they were thinking about it. Send completed tanks, not kits. Another example of the problem was given in the case of an improved cam for the oil gear traverse motor. Apparently 1,332 of the things had been shipped to Europe by this date in December 43, only to discover that only 700 tanks with oil gear traverse were actually there to accept them. Then there was a discussion about the quick fix armor protection kits. Now these are the additional plates welded over the turret side for the gunner and the ammunition stowage in the sponson, together with the skeletonized turret basket, which removes some of the protective walling around the turret basket and allows greater access from the turret to the hull. NATO had requested 500 of these kits. These were time consuming modifications, but not massively difficult to actually do. So perhaps the tasking could be cascaded down to troops in rest areas. On the other hand, thought the committee, the troops wouldn't exactly be getting much rest if they were spending all their time welding and cutting steel. In the end, the theater commander they decided could figure out the division of work, because after all the theater commander had asked for the kits in the first place. Now as a counterpoint, there was a decision to not send conversion kits for the M34 gun mount to the M34A1 standard. Now this basically consists of the installation of a coaxial telescope to be used in addition to the periscopic sight. This was however considered to be too labor intensive to do in the field. So the decision was made to simply ship over completed new production M34A1 mounts, which could then be installed in the field. Score one for the modular design of the Sherman's turret. Uh, as it, all it, you needed to do was just undo a whole bunch of screws and bolts around the outside of the mantlet. Uh, even if the actual size and weight of the components, i.e. the entire M34A1 mount, uh, was much bigger than just a simple conversion kit, but it makes it easier at the far end. Another example of the differences between what was desired and what was possible was a chain of meetings around April of 1944. Now at this point, of course, D-Day hadn't yet happened. The 76 millimeter tank was in full production, but still, you know, things are, people, folks are thinking about the future. Major General C.L. Scott set up a conference with the best officers that he could find at Fort Knox. They included anybody from General Camp, who wrote Tankers in Tunisia, which is freely available online, by the way, and General Robinet, who was a com uh, combat command commander in 1st Armored Division in North Africa. Then you go down to Colonel Williams of Armored Board, the directors of tactics, the gunnery department, medical research, i.e. ergonomics today, doctrine and organization, tests and equipment sections, and a whole bunch of other folks with combat or development experience. Now, unfortunately, nobody from the R&D or service forces was present. And so this is purely a matter of, this is what we want without any regards as to whether or not such things were possible not just technologically, but also in terms of production. The premise was, quote, to provide our soldiers with a tank which will give them at least an even chance against the enemy on the battlefield. Some quoting from the report of the conference follows, open quote. Except for a short time after the appearance in battle of our M4, German tanks have consistently excelled our tanks in quality and design of suspension systems, performance of guns, caliber for caliber, and in fire control equipment. The present torsion bar suspension, as tested in the T-24 tank, may eliminate the first deficiency. Our present fire control instruments which are coming off production will equal if not excel the German in every respect. Our present tank guns are inferior to the German tank guns of like caliber in muzzle velocity and consequently in armor piercing qualities. The new German Panther tank is superior to any American tank, including the T25E1 and T26E1 in the following respects. Power, with figures given of 690 horsepower for the HL230. Armament, see attached chart for armor penetration power, and ammunition stowage. 
The Panther carries 75 rounds of 75mm ammunition. The only comparable tank we have, the 90mm tanks T25E1 and T26E1, carry only 48 rounds of 90mm ammunition. While it is conceded that the primary objective of our armour is to engage the enemy infantry in position, artillery and rear installations, experience has shown that the enemy will always counter an armoured penetration with his own armour. Therefore, in order to operate successfully against remunerative and desirable enemy installations, we shall first have to defeat the enemy armour. To do this, we must have a fighter tank which is superior to the fighter tank of the enemy. Available information on the characteristics of German tanks as compared to those of our nation show that no American tank can equal the German Panther in all-around performance. This German tank first appeared on the battlefield in early 1943, and it can be assumed that the enemy is progressive and is continuing developments to improve his fighting vehicles to a point where even the Panther will be superseded by a more powerful and better all-around vehicle. Now, I'm going to detour out a little bit now and quote the same General Scott in early 1945, about a year and a half later. Uh, not even a year and a half, the April 44, about a year later. Uh, and just to show some of the difference of this is what I think after experience. Quote, Since the Third Army started fighting the Germans in August, German tank losses have been virtually double those of Third Army, 2,287 to 1,136. Mobility and offensive ability and equipment are requirements which best fit our tactics and strategy and the characteristics of the American soldier. This is not idle chatter, but is being proven daily in combat and by nearing defeat of one of our enemies who is supposed to be the last work in armor in the Blitz. All in all, to meet the requirements of many theaters and many varying conditions of combat in each theater, we have the finest all-around, all-purpose light and medium tanks in the world. A fighter tank to pierce heavy armor and to fight hostile tanks is now ready only a year and a half after the demand for it came from the battlefront. And that is quite a reversal. I mean, score one for 2020 hindsight. Anyway, back to April 44. In order to perform their primary mission, armored units should have the following types of tank, they said. A. Light tank for battlefield reconnaissance and security. This need will be amply met for future operations by the T-24 light tank. B. A medium tank for assaulting remunerative targets such as infantry in position, artillery and rear installations. This tank can fulfill the role of infantry support tank. By adding heavier armor and accepting reduced mobility, this heavier tank can fulfill the requirements as an assault tank. The necessary characteristics for such a tank have been outlined in letter 14 February 1944, quote, military characteristics for a medium tank, end of title. This tank requires a gun with good high explosive effect against primary targets. Since the ammunition requirements for this type of weapon are high, the 75mm gun has up to now been standard equipment. The requirement for a gun of greater high explosive effect has been met by supplementing the 75mm tank with tanks carrying 105mm howitzers. In the M4 tank, the stowage of 105mm ammunition is 20% less than 75mm ammunition and the rate of fire is somewhat reduced. Only after trial in battle can it be determined to what extent the 105mm will replace the 75mm in a new medium tank. C. A fighter tank for the primary purpose of defeating enemy armor and for the secondary role of providing direct fire support to troops assaulting fortifications and to provide a tank capable of furnishing overwatching fire for the light and medium tanks. An attempt has been made to meet this requirement by the M4E6 uh, 76mm and various experimental models mounting both the 76 and 90mm guns. To date, no satisfactory experimental models, including the T23, T25 or T26 have been developed because of failure to provide in them one or more of the following characteristics. 1. A gun superior or equal to the German. 2. Adequate stowage of ammunition and equipment. 3. Adequate fighting space for the crew to handle ammunition and fire the weapons rapidly. 4. Low ground pressure. 5. Adequate muzzle brake and ammunition combination to permit rapid and accurate fire. And this refers primarily to smoke and obscuration from firing. 6. Adequate motive power 
We have a 500 horsepower engine against a known 690 horsepower engine. It has been proposed by the Armoured Board on 6 April 1944 that for 1945 production we produce the T25E1 carrying the following guns. 105mm howitzer, 75mm gun, 76mm gun. It is conservatively estimated that in order to make the present T25E1 a fightable tank, to train personnel in its maintenance and use, and to get it on the battlefield in sufficient quantity will require 14 months. July of 1945. This estimate does not include the development, procurement and issue to theatres of suitable engineer bridging equipment, a large number of tank transporters, special tools and adequate spare parts. And again, I'm going to go on to an aside here. The standard American bridge, the M1 Treadway Bridge, maxed out at about 20, 35 tons, give or take. Now, it was officially rated for 25, but especially after some pontoon modification to make the M2, Sherman weight proved feasible. However, in late 1942, Ordnance told the engineers that there was no reasonable likelihood of a tank heavier than that being procured, so there was no merit in spending any effort in further bridge development and acquisition. So, I mean, I guess he understood the writing on the wall for the M6 Heavy, no matter what Burns felt, but of course, in the end, they go and build T26, which acquired a new bridge, the M4 Pontoon Bridge. And though the M4 pontoon bridge was approved in November of 44, and thus predates the series production of the T26E3s, the, the Pershings who went overseas, no M4 bridges made it to the war zone before the end of hostilities. Which of course leads to the, firm, uh, the famous delay at Remagen when Shermans could cross to support infantry on the far side, but the Pershings had to wait a few days. The transporter issue was solved by modification of vehicles already in existence, subject, of course, to the man hours required to do it. Anyway, back again to April 44. And but if you're new to this channel, as probably a few of you are, uh, especially after the TKS video, which seems to have blown up, you'll discover I do tend to detour on occasion. It's sort of a national trait. Since the proposed 1945 tank development program cannot be affected before July of that year, it is apparent that initial operations in Europe must be carried out with present equipment. Okay. If the initial operations are not decisive, a completely new tank superior to anything yet developed in this country will be required for new operations. It is believed that such a tank can be produced in approximately 18 months. The time gained by a tank known to be inferior to the present German Panther, i.e. T25E1, instead of this proposed fighter tank, offers no advantage. It is therefore recommended that the proposed 1945 tank production program be reconsidered. That in order to provide the type of medium tank referenced to above, immediate steps be taken to initiate and vigorously carry out development of a new medium tank. That in order to provide the required fighter tank, the Ordnance Department, in conjunction with Armored Board, National Defense Research Council, and Armored Medical Research Laboratory, be directed to develop immediately a gun with ammunition, turret, and fire control system, which will excel the German 7.5 uh, 7 KWK-42, and which can be mounted on the same tank chassis above. That if this recommendation is impossible, what, well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, look how long it took them to, to design the other tanks. The above agencies be directed to produce a replica of the German Panzer V with a 75 KWK-42, which will permit our troops to fight on at least equal terms with the enemy. Now, of course, this entire report was promptly ignored by most everybody. Uh, however, it's still informative as it is demonstrative of how the perceptions of tank inferiority applied to some of the senior staff of armored force at the time, not only the tank crew. It's also interesting to note that they didn't say a thing about armor. They only talked about the gun, which actually does, again, if you digress, you look at what the Germans were saying, let's say when they met the KV, says, you know, we don't need more armor, we need a bigger gun. We get a bigger gun, we're happy, we can deal with the light armor. Americans were saying the same thing, even in the field. Give us a gun that would kill tanks, we don't care about the level of armor. But either way, the, this, this, whole, uh, this whole conference that he had, and it looks like he just came up with the idea on his own and just gathered it. I mean, the guy's a major general. You can't exactly say no when, if you're a colonel and this major general comes along and says, hey, I'm putting together a meeting. You are invited. No, invited, you're going to go. 
nobody had asked him to put this together and obviously as I say with nobody there from ordinance or uh, or procurement some of the realities of what they're talking about still as an ex as a, an exercise shall we say in in uh, a focus group in wishful thinking I guess you have that valid however less ignored than this conference was a message from London Army Ground Forces asked the European theater what sort of armament they wanted on 1945 production of tanks. Because again, you got a bit of lead time here. A Colonel Heath brought back the reply. A, armament. 105 mm howitzer, 75% of the tanks. 90 mm gun, 25% of the tanks. The two types of armament are definitely desired. The proportions must be considered as tentative. B, ammunition. 70 rounds of ammunition is the minimum acceptable in each tank with both types of weapons. 70 rounds is to be considered as the minimum figure more rounds are urgently desired. C. Mobility. The theater desired no reduction in mobility. Additional armor is not desired if it cuts into mobility. The theater considers the mobility of medium tank M4A1 as unsatisfactory because it is underpowered. The standard of mobility is the medium tank M4A3. D. Widths greater than 124 inches are acceptable only if bridges capable of handling wider tanks are furnished. E. The bow machine gun to be retained. F. It must be kept in mind that tanks must be moved by transporters. G. Reduced ground pressure is desired. They then gave the European perspective on the information that they were receiving about this proposed new tank that they were about to get, the T-25E1. Not the 26, the 25, the one with less armor. It listed the following as advantages as the European theater saw it. Designed with the 90mm gun turret. Has a torque converter for simplified driving. Has improved suspension providing a smoother ride will provide improved ground pressure characteristics if provided with a T26E1 track and suspension, which is wider, has a favorable silhouette. It also lists the following as disadvantages of the T25. It will not meet the theater's stated requirement for ammunition. Extreme difficulty is being encountered in providing an accessible stowage of 52 rounds of ammunition. A satisfactory turret for the 105mm howitzer has not been built. And indeed it wouldn't be until you get to the, uh, the M45, which saw service in Korea. This tank is a new design and its mechanical perfection is not yet complete. Now there's an understatement for April 44. It must be expected that it will have to go through a period of teething troubles. Wide bridges are required if this tank is to be used. The rate of fire will be very slow, unless vast improvement can be made in the ammunition stowage. This improvement is doubtful. Progress is slow on the development of smokeless, flashless rounds of ammunition for the 90mm gun. And in fairness, they would fix that one. The time required to place this tank in production will be considerable, and it is estimated that adequate quantities for combat service cannot be available before 1945. Considerable training will be required when units previously equipped with medium tanks M4 series are re-equipped with this tank. When the T26E1 track and suspension are added, the weight of the tank, now at 78,000 pounds, will be increased by between 2 to 3,000 pounds. Now the other proposal considered was for the M4A3 with a 90mm turret, and it says of this possibility. It is possible that the requirements for the European Theatre of Operations can be met by mounting a 90mm gun turret, similar to the T25 design, on the hull of the medium tank M4A3. The hull of the medium tank M4A3 will be equipped during the latter part of 1944 production with the 23-inch track and the horizontal volume spring suspension. Such a tank will have the following advantages. It is estimated that between 60 and 70 rounds can be stowed in this tank without overcrowding the uh, fighting compartment. And again, because you've got the big sponsons. It's, it's always an advantage to having a high tank as well as a disadvantage. There is, in production in 1944, a 105mm uh, 105 105 mm howitzer turret on this tank. 
The mechanical components of this tank are very well developed and proven. The change in spare parts to ensure adequate maintenance will be a minimum. The retraining required for troops to be re-equipped with this tank will be a minimum. This tank can use existing 124 inch bridges. This tank can be transported on existing transporters. The time required to place this tank into production will be a minimum, since no new hull and mechanical components are required. The principal design work required will be to redesign the ammunition arrangements. On the negative side, an increase in height of silhouette due to the greater height of the 90mm turret, which was about 4.5 inches over the 76mm tank, and about a foot higher than the silhouette of a T25E1. It will have less armor protection than T25E1, but will be equal to the M4 on the hull and greater than the M4 on the turret. The suspension will not provide as satisfactory riding characteristics as the T25E1 suspension. Okay, you got bogey versus torsion bar. Estimated gross weight of tank, 80,490 pounds, or 4,490 pounds more than an M4A376 HVSS. They then suggested making an entirely new hull design to meet the ETO's requirements, but since they realized that the chances of this happening for 1945 production will be slim, so obviously they're doing better than General Scott already, and that the final vehicle will probably have less armor than the T25 and also look a heck of a lot like an M4A3 hull, I'm just going to skip over that section of the report. It doesn't go any further anyway, really. So Armored Board had a chew on this, and they came up with a couple of RFIs, uh, requests for information. So for example, they figured that they could install 52 rounds into T25E1 and an additional 18 rounds, not in wet stowage, if you took away the bow gunner's position, you just got rid of the bow gunner and you put the 18 rounds in there and that'll get you to 70. Would the ETO accept such a modification? Because after all, they said they want, they want to keep the bow gunner. How quickly would they require the tanks? If they want the T25E1, it would be May or June 45. If they would accept a 90mm M4A3, maybe they could get them by January 45. If they would take the 52 round T25E1, would they accept a tracked armored ammunition carrier to resupply the tanks to make up for the, you know, the ammunition deficiency? They also observed that the T26E1 would have the same advantages and disadvantages as the T25E1, except would have increased weight and reduced mobility, which would not meet ETO requirements. The board stated, uh, quote, in the opinion of Armored Board, none of the available tanks are entirely suitable as 90mm gun carrying tanks. It appears that none of them will completely meet the requirements established by the European Theatre of Operations. The medium tank T25E1 has its principal deficiency in the matter of ammunition stowage and incomplete development. The medium tank M4A3 with 90mm turret has less disadvantage in the matter of ammunition stowage, but has greater advantages from the standpoint of being readily placed in production, causing less disturbance to the spare part supply and in less training of troops. In the opinion of Armored Board, the use of a 90mm turret on the M4A3 chassis offers the most promising means of meeting the European Theatre of Operations requirements. A powerful consideration in this opinion is, is the, uh, the fact that, with proper support, the medium tank M4A3 with 90mm gun can be made available in combat quantities from 6 to 8 months earlier than the T25E1. Both the medium tanks T25E1 and medium tank M4A3 with the 90mm gun, when ready for battle, will weigh approximately 80,000 pounds. Thus, it appears that neither solution will meet the ETO desires in the matter of mobility. In any event, the use of either the medium tank T25E1 with the T26 suspension or the medium tank M4A3 with the 90mm gun can be regarded as only an unsatisfactory expedient in providing a 90mm gun tank. Every effort should be made to design a tank which will be a satisfactory 90mm gun tank. The most important consideration in determining which expedient tank, since they're both going to be expedient anyway, is to be used to meet the European Theatre of Operations requirement is of when 90mm gun tanks are required on the battlefield in Europe. So Armoured Board recommended that, based on the limited information at the then present time, waiting for the RFIs to come back from Europe again, the medium tank M4A3 mounting a 90mm gun be considered 
the most promising means of meeting the ETO's need for a 90mm gun tank. But before the final decisions were made, wait till you hear back on those RFIs from Europe. They also recommended a new tank be designed to meet the latest characteristics required. A couple of weeks later, 17th of May 1944, another meeting was held in Fort Knox and this time they dragged General Barnes out from his office in DC to partake. So now you know, you know you've got somebody on the supply side or the design side actually partaking in all this. Firstly, it was observed that after doing some rejiggering, technical term, uh, they could manage to put 71 rounds into T25 and T26, of which 12 would be in the turret. Stowage items may have to be sacrificed or moved, and the protection of wet stowage was no longer an option. They, they just didn't have the room. The turret would be crowded, and access to the driver's compartment difficult. This is caused by the requirement from ETO to retain the bow machine gun. The 71 rounds, though, could be attained if all other matters were subordinated. That's a direct quote. The T25 with the T26 suspension would be possible. It would add about a ton and a half to the weight of the tank and obviously also to the weight of metal being dragged around by the, uh, by the engine. But ground pressure would drop to about 11 psi. The overstrength T26 E1 suspension would probably also require less maintenance. The M4 with the 90mm turret, as mentioned, would not meet the ETO's requirement for mobility of the M4A3 with a 75mm gun or better, but T25 and T26 would. The width problem was being addressed by changes to regulation and engineer equipment, which, as mentioned earlier, was not actually going to end up going to Europe until after the war ended. Most importantly, though, and why this wasn't stated as item number one and just stopped the argument to begin with, I've no idea, Ordnance Branch declined to agree to the use of the 90mm M4 tank instead of T25 or T26. The M4 with the 90mm gun was not a better tank overall than T26, and it would not have been possible to get 90mm guns before the T25 and T26 tanks entered production. The bottleneck was 90mm gun production, which had been completely stopped. Orders had to be placed immediately for any requirements desired a year later. So, if you're going to get a 90mm gun tank, you are not going to get it any sooner if it were mounted on a Sherman or on a Pershing hull. And thus it was that the 90mm on Sherman became an item of curiosity as opposed to a program of record. It was done, like many experiments the DUS did, just to see if it could be done and what would happen. The issue of the ammunition, by the way, did not go away so easily. On the 5th of January 1945, a letter was sent by General Gatehouse of the British Supply Mission to DC to the Chief of Ground Requirements, Army Ground Forces, a General Waldron. The British had noticed that in the revised fighting compartment designs of the 76mm Sherman, the T26 and T29, Armoured Board were now prepared to accept the principle of placing unarmoured ready rounds high up in the tank, in the turret. On this point, the director of the Royal Armour Corps, Raymond Briggs, found himself, quote, in complete disagreement with the Armoured Board. When referring to the arrangements that there would be occasions or, or specific circumstances which would consider the risk of extra ammunition more justified, and acknowledging that the argument was hardly new, he wrote, quote, it appears to us that such arguments do not justify the production of a vehicle with a lower degree of protection against fire than has been proven possible to obtain. He then referenced to reporting from Italy, which said that a high percentage of Churchills had caught fire and that the cause appeared to be due to ammunition, which was also observed that no knocked out 76mm Shermans had burned when there was little doubt that a regular Sherman would have burned. This confirmed the British opinion that the chief cause of tank fires was ammunition. Information coming in from Western Europe to the British Army was no less convincing, and Gatehouse said that the old system of positioning unarmoured rounds high up in the tank was a retrograde step which only the man on the spot is justified in taking for special reasons for a specific operation. The British proposed a compromise, a small ready rack consisting of armoured rounds. Minimum of five, maybe up to seven if they can get them to fit. They would rather have a few armoured rounds than a large number of unarmoured ones. The American reply must completely baffle the British in its inconsistency. Firstly, 
it says that the lack of wet stowage in the turret rack was a result of an ETO demand for extra ammunition, okay? but that the folks in the US felt that with the increased armor on the tank, it was an acceptable change. Then it notes that US tankers initially wanted to carry as much ammunition as possible in the tank when they entered battle, but as they became more experienced, carrying extra rounds was not as prevalent and was now actively frowned upon. However, they say, lack of suitable battlefield resupply has resulted in excessive ammunition being carried regardless. Also, regardless, there was a universal demand for ready racks. Then, quote, An analysis of the tank losses in the 1st US Army indicates that ammunition is not the primary cause on the majority of fires in burned tanks. Then, a quote again, while there is considerable weight in the thought that most burned out tanks are due to initial fires in the ammunition, there is no conclusive proof of this theory and there is considerable doubt. Seriously? I mean, ordnance are fairly convinced. They did tests. There is a reason that they created wet stowage. There's a reason why carrying extra ammunition is, quote, frowned upon by the commanders in the field. Then he goes and says, it is recognized that unprotected ammunition high up in either the turret or the hull of the tank offers a definite hazard so far as fires initiated by enemy projectiles piercing the tank is concerned. And what else has been causing those fires in First Army then? In any case, their position was that if you were to armor any worthwhile number of rounds in the ready rack, there would be a serious reduction in space for the loader. Which, if comma is anything to go by, is true. In view of this fact, and of the questioned cause for the majority of tank fires, it was believed that the calculated risk of unprotected ammunition and ready racks in the turrets of tanks must be accepted. But to make you happy, we'll look at trying to invent an armored one anyway. So God knows what the British thought about that BS. It is of interest to note, of course, that over time the use of unprotected stowage became again more and more common, as tank rounds kept getting bigger and room to stow them all became more of a premium. I mean, look at an M60 or a Leopard 1 or an Arietta, and no one seems to bat an eye at the unprotected ammunition and the turret. And of course, ordnance would have been very happy to dispense with the bow gunner in order to simplify and strengthen the front hull, but the end user would have nothing of it. The Firefly Sherman conversion would not apparently have sat well with them. But I didn't anyway, but that's for, for the turret reasons. Anyway, I thought all this might be of some interest to you in understanding the deliberations behind why the vehicles came out as they were. It wasn't just the designers on the drawing boards and mock-ups trying to be as efficient as possible with the guidance of Armored Force. The end users who were in the front line seemed to know what they wanted. Now, of course, all these exchanges, with the exception of that last one about ammunition stowage, uh, happened before D-Day, when in practice the ETO didn't seem all that pushed about 76mm tanks, let alone anything bigger. After all, a month later from all this, those 76mm tanks would be left behind in the UK for reasons that really weren't as serious as the concerns they had over the 90mm tanks. Right, so that said, I hope you found all the above interesting and informative, and I will see you at the next one, which I shall add is going to be pre-recorded and not released live, unlike all these other ones, due to my being out of town on military leave for a couple of weeks. So I'm also not going to be responding very much on Patreon. Sorry. Uh, Patreon or uh, Discord. So, right, as I say, again, look at the link below for the t-shirts, and uh, I'll see you on the next one. Take care.